What's going on guys? I, I think I'm live as usual. You guys are going to have to let me know if, uh, if you hear audio because there's always a delay and I, I can't hear myself. That would be weird. So let me know if there's no audio. I didn't test this. <laughs> I probably should have test, tested things, but yeah. Um, but we have like a couple seconds delay usually, so um, if you can't hear me, I think you'd probably tell me, maybe. I don't know. Do you guys like my mug, by the way? It's just the best mug in the world. Nobody's letting me know anything. Okay, hearing okay. Okay, we're good. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, uh, I'm at home because uh, here in Portugal we have uh, like weekend lockdowns right now. It's, they're not full lockdowns. You can be out from 8 a.m. until 1 p.m. So uh, basically after 1 p.m. you have to be home. You can't be running around on the streets. I don't even know if you're allowed to go for exercise or things like that outside the hour. So, excuse me, I, uh, I had to come home from the studio at 1. So, yeah, I'm at home. And uh, that's why there's no, uh, no really great audio. That's why there's no scene. Uh, eventually, I'm going to have the studio set up in a way that I can have these really cool live stream sessions going that look super professional rather than just against the, the wall in the kitchen. <laughs> it was, hopefully that happens and hopefully a monkey doesn't come running through and try to eat one of the cables or something like that. Um, yeah, so that's about it. No monkey for now because it's basically monkey is the most active rabbit in the world in the mornings and the evenings. But in the middle of the day, she just like sleeps under the couch. <laughs> super lazy. Or every now and then she'll like jump on Jody's desk and attack her while she's trying to do work, which is pretty funny. Okay, so I honestly have no game plan at all for for this this chat. I just wanted to come online and um, see what you guys are up to. Uh, maybe chit chat a little bit, do a QA. and a um, because I think a lot of us are kind of just home on the weekends right now because the whole world is, uh, is basically sort of kind of locked down ish right now with things going crazy, which sucks, but that's kind of life early 2021. So we're going to do a Q and a style and then uh, eventually, actually, before we get into the questions, I want to announce a new tour. Um, with Joe Allum, actually, in 2022. So that's February 2022. I'm going to be running a photography workshop with Joe Allum in uh, in Japan. And I have the dates here. I'm scrolling. If it looks like I'm doing something, that's exactly what I'm doing. Uh, the dates are February 17th to 27th. It starts and ends in Tokyo. We'll be going to Tokyo, but also Kyoto and uh, Osaka and Fuji. So it's going to be an awesome trip. If you guys don't know Joe, go check out his YouTube. He's awesome. He's a really like tech savvy dude who, uh, who's like an amazing street photographer and he really works well at, with night photography. And so I think it's a, a nice mix. I'm like an early morning type of person. He's a late night type of person. We can kind of almost split the groups uh, throughout the day. And it should be awesome. It should be a really good trip. I think we'll will complement each other really well. And it's kind of funny because the last trip I did, uh, which was March 2020, was with Joe in Morocco. And that was the first trip we ever did together. And it was amazing working with Joe because he's so intelligent, uh, especially when it comes to photography and street photography and tech. And he's so different than me. And I kind of always just have this weird assumption that everybody's similar to me. And so we went in and we were so different that it was almost comical. But I think it really works well now knowing how different we are. For example, it was like six in the morning and I'm up ready to go. I'm like out the door ready to shoot and Joe's just like waking up. He's just not a morning person at all. But yeah, knowing this, I think we're actually going to be an awesome, awesome team. So head to the website if you want to check that out. There is a link, I believe, in the description of this video. So yeah, that's uh, what's going on. I'm gonna start jumping into questions. Um, if I don't answer your question right away, um, hopefully I'll get back to it. So just don't keep repeating the question over and over and over again. If I see you doing that, I'm definitely not gonna answer your question. 
Um, there was a one question from Marcus from Brazil. He says, do you have a plan, a plan for a workshop in Brazil in the future? And actually, yeah, there was a plan actually in place to do Brazil in 2021. We were actually supposed to be there in a couple months. Now, I don't know if it's going to be possible or when it's going to be possible. Um, the original plan for the Brazil photography workshop was a mix of kind of the classic stuff on the coast and the Pantanal. If you guys have never been to Brazil, uh, the Pantanal is actually the most biodiverse place on earth. In August, September, early October, it's the best place in the world to see jaguars. They are, there are so many of them. They're, they're just everywhere to the point that a lot of local operators there guarantee you a jaguar a day seeing one or you get your money back. So it's pretty incredible. Uh, that's really, really high on my list. I've been twice already. Uh, but I really want to go back. So the Brazil plan was going to be like Rio de Janeiro. Um, I don't even remember what else. Maybe Ilha Grange. Um, I can't remember what else on the coast down there. And then the Pantanal. So it was going to be a cool trip. And hopefully we'll still be able to do that in the future at some point. The thing with the, the workshops right now is that basically we had to postpone so many trips from 2020 to 2021 that half of the 2021 schedule is already filled with old trips. Actually, basically everything from 2020 had to be filled to 2021. Now in 2021, we're having to decide what's going to need to be postponed again to 2022. So we can't really do anything new, which really sucks. But at the same time, it is what it is. So um, hopefully we'll be able to figure that out. I'm hoping to do a Brazil trip in 2022 uh, maybe August or September, but it might be 2023 before we get there. But it's definitely, definitely, definitely high on my list. Um, to do what else is going on? Sorry, I'm just bad at reading, and I I, st I go looking for questions, and I end up reading the comments like I'm not live on YouTube, which is super awkward. Um, Graham Simpson asked, would you consider a photo trip somewhere less exotic like the UK? This is the funny thing about people anywhere in the world. No matter where you live, people think where you're from is not exotic. To me, the UK is so exotic. <laughs> and I know that sounds crazy, but it's just so different from where I am. It's like, uh, you got coast. I didn't have an ocean the, like to get to the nearest ocean from where I was. It was like a 14 hour drive. I only saw the ocean in my entire life from age one to 18. I saw it when we did a road trip when I was eight. And I saw it when I was in Japan when I was 13. So I only saw the ocean twice. <laughs> so the ocean's exotic. And yeah, there I really want to do a workshop in the UK, either in Ireland, Northern Ireland, um, and also with you know, Ireland Republic. And then potentially I'd love to do Scotland as well, but I'd also love to do something in Cornwall, but there's a lot of logistical issues there, um, with operating something commercially that I'd have to figure out. And then of course it changes again because of Brexit, because as a resident of Europe, which I'll be in Portugal, I can work anywhere. I can operate tours anywhere. I don't know what the deal would be with the UK. I'm assuming it would be fine but I might just have to hire a local photographer to be the leader like I have to do in the U S in the U S to run a tour for me to run a tour there. My company has to hire a local photography tour company as the supplier. And then basically when I go along, I'm not working. I'm leading my group that somebody else is working for. It's, you know, just a, a roundabout way of doing it. And I assume I'd have to do the same in the UK. So yeah, I'd love to do a trip in the UK. Uh, there was a plan to do a Scotland retreat at some point, but again, with all that's going on, it's really, really hard to plan. <laughs> See, Wadger Ketcher says we are very exotic. He agrees with me. Good man. Um, Rock and Roll Reese asks, what's the best focal length for wildlife photography? This is the thing about basically all kinds of photography. There is no perfect focal length because... Different, per, different focal lengths give you different perspectives. People always ask what the best uh, landscape photography lens is. 
And it really depends on the moment. Sometimes you want to get really wide and kind of make things feel 3D. And sometimes you want to get things like very telephoto and compress them. With wildlife, in general, I think 600 millimeters is like the, the lens. Like if you can only buy one lens, buy a 600 millimeter. I've been doing so much coffee. I'm now talking in milliliters instead of millimeters. Ah, anyway, I think that the one lens for wildlife photography is a 600 millimeter. I think that's such a good lens. But you can get really cool results with a wide angle lens as well. Some of my favorite wildlife photos I've ever taken are shot on a 16 to 35. So it depends on the moment. It depends on the mood you're trying to, to get. But that 600 millimeters seems to be the sweet spot. I had 600 millimeters in Namibia and only 400 in South Africa. And my images from Namibia are far better than my South Africa images. And yes, the moments we had in Namibia were a little bit better than South Africa, but not as much as the images were better. Um, JP Sullivan, thanks for the tip. Appreciate that. I'll, uh, I'll buy Jody a beer. Jody, do you want a beer? No. She says no. Uh, I'll buy Jody something. Um, I'll buy monkey parsley. That's like a year's worth of parsley for monkey. Are you going to do any online workshops like mastermind and stuff? Um, I did do that for a little bit. There will be more coming soon. I've just been so busy trying to get the studio arranged that it's been tough to do. So uh, there will be more in online workshops. I'm planning on doing an intermediate Lightroom workshop probably in a week or two. So yeah, that's definitely going to happen at some point. It's just finding the time. And here in Portugal, there's talk that we might be going on lockdown again next week. So in that, if that's the case, I'll have tons of time because I've been working so much at the studio on the coffee shop and getting prints ready and stuff that I haven't even been on my computer in a week. I was on my computer last Saturday. I didn't take my computer home on Sunday and then didn't touch my computer again until yesterday. So um, I could definitely use with some, some computer time. <laughs> I've been working way too much. Um, Chris Perea is on. What's up, Chris? Yes, I've got coffee. It's only my second for the day. Don't worry about me. My biggest concern is with a coffee shop. I have like coffee at my disposal all the time. I'm just going to be like super addicted to caffeine pretty soon. Um, Neil says, if you didn't have a sponsorship from Squarespace, would you still use their website? I use WordPress and have fantastic easy control over the site looks by using Imagely's plugins. That's interesting. Um, the reality with Squarespace is if they weren't sponsoring me, would I be using them for their my, my website? I'm not actually using Squarespace for my website. Spoiler. But it's not because I don't love Squarespace. It's because I had a WordPress site. I've had that site for 11 years. And it's really hard to migrate to Squarespace. But if I was building a new website, I'd be building it on Squarespace for ease sake, I think. Especially if I wasn't very techie, which I'm not. Um, I think I would probably start a Squarespace site. For example, our Antarctica website that Tom and I put together, we did that on Squarespace just because it was easier, in my opinion. And I do love WordPress. There's things you can do on WordPress that you can't do on Squarespace. But I could build a Squarespace site that looks good in like an hour or two. Whereas with WordPress, it took me a really, really long time. So um, yeah, that's, uh, that's my opinion on that. Jordan says 600 milliliters of coffee you'll be seeing black and white and smelling colors dude that's true but we've been like I've been testing recipes because the type of coffee we're making is like specialty coffee so we're doing v60 coffee which I'm not sure if you guys know what that is it's like a filter that goes on a top and a cone and then the round base and then you have to pour the hot water on it and like the exact right way it's super intricate and so I'm messing around with the dosing of how much coffee needs to be in and how long they need to go and the grind of them and how much water and our large coffee our large filter coffee is 600 milliliters so that's why 600 milliliters is on my mind chance sellers here i'm assuming from arizona what's going on chance um will i ever do a workshop in sedona joy asks yes yeah, so like the last air i just yelled that didn't i sorry i get it like my volume goes like this 
<laughs> yes, we will do another Arizona workshop at some point in the future. But again, it's just not in the cards right now. Uh, our last workshop, we did spend a couple days in Sedona. It's so awesome there. It's so photogenic. And if you're looking for a Sedona trip, um, Chris Perea and Mike Perea do do Sedona trips, I believe, quite often. So go and check them out. Chris is on the chat, actually. Um, here comes Monkey for the run. I'd pick her up, but I don't want you. I don't want to scare her. <laughs> She's just running head under the couch. So yeah, if you want to do a Sedona workshop, give Mike and Chris Perea a shout because um, yeah, because they're awesome. And they know all the spots. Like when we went to Sedona, I've been to Sedona 10 times. They took me to spots I didn't know about. So definitely, uh, definitely look them up. Um, doo -doo -doo. You can feel free to drop some more questions in because I'm behind. I missed all of them. <laughs> Greg asks, can I make a panda in my coffee art? No, but I'm really, really good at making a... Uh, What's a, a non crew? I'm very good at making, accidentally making aubergine, eggplant in my coffee. Today I tried to make a heart and I made, a, I made an eggplant. It's bad. Um, Jordan says, go for 22 grams of rough grind, 250 mil of water. You, it's like you're reading my mind, man. I did 21 grams and 250. So yeah, we're pretty much sweet. Um... Let's try to scroll through some of these messages. And Greg Snell's on the chat, by the way, guys. Everybody say hi to Greg. He's a troublemaker. Um, how hard was it to get into starting doing photo workshops? That's a great question. Um, photo workshops are obviously like the number one way that photographers are making income, I think, these days. But it's not easy. And I think a lot of photographers rush into it in two ways. One, they've never led a trip before. And when you don't, you've never led a trip, you don't know what goes into it from a logistics standpoint, getting permits, um, figuring out locations, timings. It, it's a lot of work pricing it. So from that standpoint, it's really hard. I was lucky in that when I started my travel career, I had a tour leader job as my voice cracks, a tour leader job in South America. So I was leading small group tours in uh, basically all over the west side of South America for a full year. And those trips were crazy intense because they were local transport trips. So I had 16 passengers and literally had to take them all and book their entire trips for them. I have no idea where all the excess money went from the company because I was doing everything. I was booking their bus trips, I was booking their taxis, I was booking their hotels. I think other than taking the payments, the company didn't do anything. And somehow they still went bankrupt. So yeah, it was, it was a crazy, crazy experience, but it was really good to learn that. Then the second thing um, that's hard is obviously marketing it. Trying to find people to go on your trips is really hard. You need to have uh, either an audience or you need to have a super niche. Uh, and I think having an audience, it's still hard. If you can have an audience and a super niche, it's the easiest. Uh, for example, I started doing trips just in Peru. I just did photo workshops in Peru. My first three were there just because that was my specialization because I had lived in Peru. So I think if you're going to start doing workshops, start locally and then build up. Start locally and then grow globally. Isn't that what like the bio, Biodome guy said, Pauly Shore? Think locally. Yeah, I'm not going to go there. Um, yeah, so think locally and then move towards globally. Uh, there's a photographer named Mike Mazul in Texas. And I don't know his story, but I'm assuming this is kind of how it started. And he does a lot of storm chasing in Texas and uh, the south of the U.S. and the central U.S., and he kind of built workshops there. And then he specialized towards moving in places like uh, Hawaii and the Lofoten Islands in Norway. And then you can kind of specialize in these areas, become known for those areas, and then continue, continue to branch out. So it can be really, really challenging trying to find clients. And it's, yeah, it's just tough. So and it's definitely hard. Uh, I'm going to scroll back. 
<laughs> Tiago says, I have no photography questions. I just want to know why you wear your hat backwards. This hat backwards thing kind of started when I was, when I left call when I was left college and started traveling because I'm pretty bald. And it's not that I'm annoyed that I'm bald or sad about it. It's that when you travel and you're bald, you burn your head a lot because it's sunny and hot in lots of places. And I had to start wearing hats, but my hats, hats look stupid on me. They don't look good on me. And so I can't wear a typical baseball hat because I have such a small little head. You see that tiny little head? And I was home in Canada and going through some of my opa, my grandfather's old stuff. And my grandpa always used to wear snapbacks, John Deere snapbacks. And I had this box of them and I just took a couple of them because I was like, I'll take some of opa's hats. And I started wearing opa's hats when I was traveling because they covered my head. I found out that they looked halfway decent on me. But as a photographer, I don't have a camera here. Let's pretend this power bank's a camera. As a photographer, you go up to take a picture and you hit yourself in the brim of the hat. So I started flipping the hat around. Then I was dating this girl and she hated my hats, hated them. So I stopped wearing them. And that's when I started my YouTube channel is with the hats. Then I went on to, I was on YouTube for about six months, a year. And I had like a, a call with YouTube where they kind of critique your channel and try to help you, you know, find an audience. And they said something to me. They, they said, Brendan, the thing about you that we love is that you're like anybody else. You're just an average guy. The thing we don't like about you is that you're just an average guy. It's really hard to see you as a distinctive trademark or brand. So what can you do for your brand? And then they said, we saw a couple of your older videos where you're wearing this backwards hat. I think that could be your brand. And then so I just started wearing the backwards hat and it just stuck. <laughs> so that's the whole story on the backwards hat. Keeps the sun off my head and I don't smack it into the camera when I hold it up to my face. Um, what else is going on? Okay, let's go through some more questions. Would I ever come to Northern Ireland again? Absolutely. Right now, to be honest, I go anywhere. <laughs> I'm like in this awesome state where I'm super, super comfortable in Portugal, like maybe way too comfortable. Uh, but I would love to just get out and travel anywhere. Northern Ireland is so freaking beautiful. I, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine being there right now, being where, where there's like weather and yeah, yeah, I'd love it. Anyway, uh, Noah's asking if I've ever been to Montreal because he might go to college there. Yes. And if you have the chance to go to college in Montreal, you should go because Montreal is awesome. McGill, I think is the big university in Montreal. I went there when I was young, actually. Yeah, Montreal is a really, really cool city. It's like this nice mix of Europe and Canada. I love it there. Uh, any ideas or regards of Nova Scotia? I have no idea because I've never been to Nova Scotia, Alan. I am sorry. Um, doo -doo -doo. Aside from famous landscape photography names like Rachel Talabart, Elia Lacardi, Ansel Adams... Do you have any other names you'd, you want to see if we want to see good work? Oh, there's so many names. <laughs> so many. Um, Linda Wisdom is an amazing street photographer from London. She's really cool. Um, Richard Burnaby, is he's kind of like, even though I only spent very limited amount of time with him early in my photography career, he's kind of been a bit of a mentor to me from afar. He's just an incredible photographer and a really nice guy. So I would check those two guys out for sure. Um, I love Sean Tucker's stuff. If you guys don't know Sean Tucker, um, he's great. Yeah, those are some of my favorites. But if I'm being quite honest, I don't spend a whole lot of time looking at other photographers. I don't know why. I, I maybe do when I'm trying to draw inspiration. But for the most part, I'm trying to focus on what I'm doing. I don't want to get too manipulated by other people. But early in your f photography career, I think it's so important to, to need that or to do that. Um, Oregon or Utah for photography, if you had to pick one. Ooh. I think I, I haven't spent enough time in Oregon to really commit to either. <laughs> Oregon has 
some really, really beautiful coastline. And from what I saw in the pouring rain in the Columbia Valley Gorge, it's really cool there too. But I still think I have to pick Utah. It's just on a whole other level. It's just incredible. Um, the Oregon coast has some insane land, uh, seascapes. They're just out of this world. But yeah, I think I still have to go with Utah. Um, Sandra asked, will I be doing photography day trips from Lagos? I think you mean as, um, as workshops? I don't know. But yeah, the qu answer is from the new coffee shop. Okay, so let me, let me back this up and tell you what's going on with the coffee shop. Jody and I have started uh, an LDA, which is like a limited company, a uh, limited partnership. And under that partnership, there's all sorts of different business activities we're going to be operating. And they're all based out of the coffee shop, which we're, we've nicknamed the studio, by the way. So you've got the studio. Um, the coffee shop's eventually going to be called the coffee studio. And then based out of there, Jody's kind of operating in charge of the coffee shop and also selling local products and stuff like that, running events, local events out of that space. And then I'm running kind of like the photography side of things. I've got the gallery upstairs and then I'll also be running photography tours in Portugal as well. I've started a new new company called Epic Portugal or a new website called epicportugal.com. And at that company or at that, yeah, I guess that website, there'll be photography tours all over Portugal. I won't be leading most of them. I'll be hiring local photographers to do that. But out of Lagos, there's gonna be like day photography trips and every now and then I might lead those. Although for the most part, it'll be led by local photographers. So we've got so many different things happening out of that one space. And one of them is doing um, photo tours out of Lagos. As for real life, myself, I have no idea what's going on right now because like, like I said at the start of this video, I think they're talking about uh, bringing in lockdown at least for 15 days here in Portugal. So if that happens, I can't go outside my house, <laughs> let alone out to take pictures. But uh, yeah, I would have, I would have, I, I hope so. I really want to get out and start taking pictures. I'm kicking myself right now because this whole past week I've been doing stuff indoors that I probably could have done during lockdown. Um, but I didn't know this lockdown was going to happen. So yeah, that's what's going on. Um, let's go for some more questions. Thanks for the tip from Clint. Really appreciate that. Um, <laughs> Nolan asked, have I gotten my hands on the R6 yet? And that's actually a pretty funny, not a funny story, stupid story. But here's the story of the R6 and why I don't have it yet. I have a friend who runs a, who owns a camera like dealership, I guess is the way to call it, in Canada. And he said to me, hey, Brendan, if I send you an R6 uh, for free, can I use that as credit towards a future photography tour? And I said, yes, definitely. Especially if you give it to me at cost without making a profit yourself. And then I'll give you the trip without making a profit myself. And he said, deal. So basically, we made an exchange for the camera. The camera got shipped from Canada and then stuck in customs here in Portugal because in Portugal, they're really, really strict on things coming from outside the EU. They have to have the VAT paid, but they have all these forms that they need you to fill out. One of the forms is a, an invoice. It needs you to have proved that you bought the product so that they know what to charge you for VAT. But since I didn't pay for the product, they can't clear it through customs because they don't know what to charge me. There's no official amount. So I asked the guy in Canada to send me an invoice pretending I actually paid for the camera. And then I've forwarded that to customs now and I'm hoping they just charge me the customs fee for it. But honestly, I have no idea if, they're, if it's actually gonna work because it's now been rejected like six times. That R6 has been in, in customs for a month now, maybe more. By the time I get it, it's going to be locked down and I'm not going to be able to go out and take pictures anyway. Just like classic, classic stuff going on right now. Um, yeah, so hopefully I get the R6 soon because it would be nice. Okay, let me uh, scroll down. 
Um, Jimmy asks about Patty, tri Patty the Tripod from Three-Legged Thing. Is it a good starter camera? I have no experience with Patty, so I really can't comment on that. My thing with tripods though is they're holding up your camera and your camera is expensive. So you kind of want the supports to be good. Like you wouldn't build your house on a really, really soft foundation just because, you know, it's a new house. <laughs> you would, it would like your house could collapse and destroy your house. So I think never cheap out on your tripod. That being said, have a look at what the weight allowance is of the, the tripod. If it's way out does what your actual weight is of your camera, it should be fine. That being said, I have no experience with Patty. I've used some of the other budget tripods from Three Legged Thing and I've had no issue with any of them. So I'm assuming it'll be good. Somebody in this group probably knows better than I do actually. Um, let me scroll again. Do, do, do. I thought there was, oh yeah. In, somebody says any country you've been to and thought, nah, uh, in terms of photography. <laughs> That's a pretty good question because it happens, it doesn't happen quite a bit, but it happens. Uh, and it's just an inspiration thing. Um, for me, uh, French Guiana was like that. I got to French Guiana and I was like, nothing here is photogenic. <laughs> and I had a really hard time taking pictures and photo in French Guiana. Um, it was tough. I've had a couple situations where I really loved a country, but it just didn't suit my photography style. I had plans on doing a photography workshop in Sri Lanka, for example, and me and uh, my buddy Keats went and scouted it out and had an awesome time and loved it. But from a photography standpoint, it just wasn't at that level that I felt like people should come from all over the world to take pictures from a travel standpoint. There were some really cool images, um, for sure, but they weren't like my style of photo. There were a lot of portraits, there were a lot of street, and that's not really totally my style, so it just didn't seem like it suited. That being said, it was really a fun trip. Riding around on the trains in Sri Lanka, going walking where there's potentially elephants. Um, it was just an awesome trip. So hopefully, hopefully, uh, yeah, people love Sri Lanka as much as I do, but um, I just didn't think it was suitable for a photography workshop. Um, and then there's the opposite side of things as well. Like for example, when I went to the west of Australia, I thought to myself, I don't know what's there. I don't really see it as being a photography destination. And I got there and I'm like, why are there not more people coming here for photography? It's crazy. And though I've never been, when I look at Tasmania and I see all the photo potential, I'm like, why isn't everybody in Tasmania shooting pictures? It just does not make sense to me other than the fact that it's a really long ways away. So yeah, um, I guess that answers the question. Um, somebody says I'm doing a photography exhibition for friends in March, starting from scratch. Any tips? How many images? Too little, too many. Um, the thing about images is you want to keep them limited because the more photos you share, the lower your quality goes, but you don't want to limit it too little so that you don't have enough variation and people will find something they're interested in. So that's a tricky one. There's no number. In my gallery at the coffee shop, I have 9, 10, 11 or 12 images on the wall. I would try to keep it under 15, ideally, for the most part. Uh, one big tip that I failed on is buy good glass. If you're putting your photos in frames, the glass is so important because if the glass is bad, you get lots of reflections and it's hard to see the artwork. So that's just one thing. Um, one one tip I'd give. <laughs> Matthias has said that probably the Netherlands were underwhelming. And that's under, uh, going back to the previous question. I think that's so untrue. I found the Netherlands so fun as a photographer. I found them challenging, um, photographing through alleys and things like that. But I really love photographing in the Netherlands. Um, somebody asked who my favorite non-photography YouTuber is. And the funny thing about this question is I literally don't watch YouTube photography. 
I'll catch up every now and then and see what my friends are doing on YouTube. I'll see what the Pereas are doing. I'll see what Joe and, and Greg and Tom are doing. I'll go check out Wadget Catcher every now and then. I, you know, like I'll go for those things, but it's more to see what my friends are up to. I don't watch photography on YouTube. I'm usually watching sports. So my favorite, by far my favorite YouTube, photo my non-photography YouTuber is John Boy Media. And I'm not sure if you guys have heard of this dude, but he does sports in the US and he breaks down certain things that happen. They're baseball related usually, but they can be a little bit of everything. And they're usually like two, three minute videos. And I just find them so funny. He's just such a clever dude. He makes me laugh. So I absolutely love John Boy Media. Um, okay, let's, if you guys have some more questions, feel free to drop them. I'm going to try to get caught up here. Um, when the pandemic passes or calms down, do you plan on doing a workshop here in Lagos? Um, there is a workshop in July in astrophotography in the Algarve and Alentejo with uh, um, Alan Wallace. So that's happening in July. There will be day trips as well. Will says he misses the daily vlogs. I, the thing is, it's quite funny, is I really loved doing the daily vlogs myself, but they're really not for everyone. Um, like, I love them myself. I watch lots of daily vlogs, but myself doing them, I love doing them, but I can always watch the viewership go like this. It starts really high. People are like, I love daily vlogs, and then it just ends up to a point where nobody's watching. So I, that's one of the biggest reasons I don't do daily vlogs is nobody watches. Um, bless you. Jody's sneezing in the background. Um, should getting an inoculation certification open up travel again? Will you open up after nobody else is getting COVID, do you think? I think the question is, if an inoculation certification opens up travel again, or if things are just going to open up on their own, I think it's going to be a little bit of both. I think travel will slowly open as the vaccine kind of rolls out. People will have certifications. And because more people have certifications, the numbers should go down. And then I think people will start traveling with a test because tests should be more readily available. I think that slowly it's going to be like this conversion, a con convergence of people getting vaccinations and people testing and just borders opening up again. So I think personally, it won't be back to normal until the fall, but in the summer, I'm really confident that people will be traveling again for sure. Um, yeah, so Gareth said, do you use non-reflective glass for the studio? Um, the reality is I didn't because I didn't realize that was going to be a problem, but that's what you should use. Non use non-reflective glass, definitely. It doesn't matter what you do to the paper if the light can't get through the glass. It's almost like a polarizer. You need non-reflective glass or else you can get light bouncing. It's a big problem in our studio because it's a pretty dark cave-like space and then the light all comes in from one direction. So it makes it a little bit tough. Um, Jimmy asks, should a photographer pretty much give up on Instagram? No, I don't think you should give up on any platform personally. Uh, it's obviously harder to grow somewhere like Instagram now because people really aren't looking for new people to follow. But I think you need to have an Instagram because people are going to look at that as a portfolio on the quick every now and then. My advice to Instagram, to using Instagram now though is Focus much less on posting regularly. That was always like the advice was post as often as you can, once a day, keep consistent. That's what everybody used to say. I think now it's much more important to have really high quality images and use it like a portfolio. I post to Instagram maybe once every two weeks now and I only post when it's an image I really like. Um, and I've been quite successful growing my Instagram over the past six months. Um, even though we were in a pandemic and it's just from posting very few images. So I go into my Instagram. I don't know how many followers I have. 115,000. So despite not traveling in 10 months, I've got something like 10,000 new followers. So it's still possible. I think you just, 
limit what you share. Post only your absolute best. Um, for favorite, somebody's asking my favorite sport and team. I'm a basketball guy. I grew up playing basketball. My dad coached basketball and soccer. I grew up playing both. So I'm a basketball guy and the Raptors are my team even though we played, we've been playing pretty terribly to start the year. Um, do, do, do. <laughs> Somebody's saying I should just start a new channel with daily vlogs. I don't think that that's gonna happen. But I do know people that have done that, but it's not gonna happen for me. Um, Mike Perea Photography is asking, is Jody at the shop full time? So when you go on trips open up, is she running the show? She's looking at me like, do I have to work double? Um, Jody's running the show in general at the studio. So she's basically been in charge of most things. But when I'm there, we're going to be splitting duties. Um, basically both managing and as equals, I guess. And then when I'm away on trips, she'll definitely take over. But Jody's going to go away on trips as well. So Jody will go away on trips and it'll be my show, I guess, or I'll look after things. But we have already hired... How many people did we hire, Jody? Four people? We've hired four people. Uh, one full-time who will be like a manager and then two basically full-time baristas and then one full-time or one part-time staff member as well. So we have four staff members and once the summer rolls around, we'll probably have more staff as well. Um, sorry, I'm... I, I always find the lives a little bit awkward because I'm scrolling through the questions and it's like there's no feedback. Nobody's calling back. I should probably like do some sort of live Zoom where you guys can, that's a nice, that's a great, I'm just having ideas as I'm talking to you guys. Yeah, anyway, a Zoom live. We'll do that at some point. I'll figure that out. Um, where's your favorite place to take photos? Honestly, right now, anywhere. <laughs> I just like getting out with my camera right now. It's, I feel like super lucky to take my picture, my camera out anywhere. Um, Canada is one of my favorite places to take pictures in the Rockies. And there's, there's, a, <laughs> there's a laziness factor reason to it. And that you can drive to almost all the best locations. Like in Patagonia, you can drive to a parking lot and then hike 20, 30 minutes and get to a really cool spot. Sometimes it's an hour or two hours. In Canada, you can literally drive to a parking lot right next to the Epic location. And then the weather in Canada or in the Rockies and Alberta really isn't that bad. So you don't ever fight conditions like you do in places like Scotland or Ireland or uh, Pat Patagonia or Iceland. So Canada is a pretty easy play to sh place to shoot, in my opinion. And I kind of love it for that. Um... <laughs> Do do sorry, I'm just like singing to myself as I'm I'm reading through your comments and stuff like that. Um, do you ever watch your old my it's my life 365 videos and wonder how you survived it all? No, I don't because I've always been lucky and naive. And because of that, I kind of uh yeah, I kind of look back at these things and think, "Oh yeah, it was obvious that it was going to happen." Um, I would survive. I still have like a little bit of that now, but that trip definitely gave me some, <laughs> gave me some humble pie because before that trip, I just assumed that it was impossible for me to die. I always just assumed that me dying was just impossible. <laughs> and that trip, I had so many close calls that I was like, you know what? I could probably die. So it, it definitely humbled me up a little bit. <laughs> so yeah, that's what's going on. Mm. What made Jody and me decide on Portugal? Um, it's awesome. First of all, it's so beautiful here. Um, and second of all, it's the third safest country in the world behind Iceland and New Zealand. So that's awesome. Uh, residency wasn't a real challenge to get here, although I'm still working on it. I'm still not a resident, but it helped. And taxes. For foreigners, you get... How many years is it, Jody, of, of tax? Ten. You get 10 years of this tax bracket that's specifically for foreigners that you pay a maximum of 20% taxes. 
And if you're receiving income from other countries, a lot of times you don't get taxed at all. So it's a pretty beautiful situation to not have to pay taxes. <laughs> so that's, those are big reasons. But most of all, it was like when we got here to Lagos, it just, it felt like home. And it feels so much like home now, it's crazy. It's this really cool vibe. Um, it's young, it's vibrant, it's full of international people. It's like, it's like an international mosaic of people here. There's people from all over the world. And it's something really special. It's something that I always wanted to be a part of. I always assumed that I wanted to live in London or something like that because I wanted that international community. But if you ever spend time in London, yeah, you have that. But it's so almost segregated into different communities and areas, you kind of have to travel for it. Whereas here in Lagos, you go into any cafe and it's all of that right in one spot. And I think it's awesome. So I absolutely love it. Um, I think I'm going to wrap things up in about five minutes as I'm losing my voice. So if you have any more questions, feel, to, feel free to drop them. Um, sorry. <laughs> Am I going to have another go at shooting puffins? All these questions uh, are like of travel have such a, like, it, it just doesn't feel real. It doesn't feel normal. It feels like travel is so far away. So I hope I'm going to be able to shoot puffins again or attempt to photograph a puffin for my first time um, and probably fail. But I don't know. Honestly, I, I, I'm just in this state where I'm just, there's like this tunnel and I can kind of see the end, but it doesn't feel real yet. So I don't know. We have a, a photography trip in June plan to Iceland and that is going to be about photographing some puffins hopefully so hopefully that happens um somebody's asking what will happen with me and Jody if we go because monkey's got to be home um if Jody and I both leave we're we're hopefully have somebody come and look after monkey but actually we're training her to be an adventure bunny and she can travel Jody can you pass me her backpack we <laughs> she might be inside. So this is Monkey's backpack. This is, if you can see this, I, I got to wait until it shows up on my camera because of the, the delay. But Monkey <laughs> climbs into this backpack and Jody, actually, maybe she, you can put her in it. Monkey's going to try to, Jody's going to try to put Monkey in so you can see her. Um, but Monkey will climb right into the backpack and then she goes on the back and then we can walk her around. So the, um, the studio, for example, is getting a, a big monkey hutch so that when we both go to work, she can come and join us at work. And if we go travel, maybe she can come travel as well. So here's monkey. Do you have a treat for her, Jody? Yeah. We'll give her a treat if she comes up to the window to say hi. Hey, space bunny. Look at, there she is. Monkey. Monkey, do you want a treat? Monkey. There she is. <laughs> hey, buddy. <laughs> so Space Bunny, we're calling her Astronaut Bunny. Monkey, look, the tree's right there. She's looking at Mommy through the other hole. Look, Monk. Monkey. Look up here. <laughs> look up here. There Aww. it is. Hey, buddy. <laughs> look at those people. <laughs> hey, your paws up looking so cute. You want another, want another treat? Monkey. Monkey. Here you go, Monkey. Yeah, she's curious as to what's happening. So she, there's like a little space there. You can probably see her. Oh, she's hiding from you. But yeah, that's like the door that she goes in. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, there's holes all over the place. And I'm going to pass her back to Jody. So basically, we can take her to work. Uh, we're doing research on if, we, if she can fly with us. She's, she's got all her vaccinations. We don't have our vaccinations, <laughs> but she's got hers. So eventually, we think she'll be able to travel with us on shorter trips. Um, and then, at, like I said, we have friends here that will be able to house it. I don't think it'll be too hard to convince people to come for like a week holiday in Portugal and just look after Monkey a little bit as well. So it shouldn't be an issue. I really want to in 2022 or 23 buy a trailer to attach to the Defender and be able to go on trips. And again, I think Monkey would be able to come on those trips as well. So Monkey's an adventure bunny. She's really like, she's so adventurous 
It's insane. It's sometimes scary. She'll like just climb over things and she, Jody's got a standing desk, that standing height. And there's a couch way low. Every now and then she springs from the couch onto the standing desk. She is crazy and super adventurous. So um, yeah, we called her monkey and we got a monkey. <laughs> that's kind of what happened. So um, yeah. That's a, uh, that's monkey, everybody. I think somebody said I should throw her on my back and we can do a, a scooter trip down Africa again. Oh. Monkey and Brendan take on Africa. That would be amazing. Um, yeah. So I think that's, uh, that's going to basically wrap it up. Uh, thanks for joining. I didn't intend on talking for nearly an hour straight, but that kind of happens from time to time here. And I'm just glad to have something to do for an hour in lockdown. And if uh, we get locked down, I'm gonna try to do one of these Zoom live ideas I just had. Maybe we can bring on like 20 people and just try to make this a little bit more interactive because it's a little bit awkward sometimes. Chatting to myself for 20 minutes, no, 50 minutes straight. So uh, yeah, massive thanks for joining guys and girls. Um, please stay safe out there. More important than ever, love each other, be respectful to each other, be understanding of each other. And uh, yeah, that's all I got to say. You know, there's so much division and fighting right now. Just listen to people every now and then. Be nice. And thanks for listening to me and Monkey and Jody and this flamingo, which has no name. I'll see you guys on, uh, on either Wednesday or Sunday. I have a, a full video coming. And again, there's a Japan trip that's just been announced. There's a link in the description of this video. If you want to go, uh, go check that out. Anyways, take care, guys. Double peace. Peace. And now how do I turn off this stream? Later, guys.